Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Text for today is our reading from Acts, particularly these words. And by his name, by faith in his name, he made this man strong whom you see and know. That faith is through Jesus Christ that has given the man his perfect health in the presence of you all. You may be seated. So for our uh, sermon series, we are uh, continuing this summer going through the book of Acts. Where we're looking at uh, the concept and the idea of the world turned upside down. And that actually comes from Acts chapter 17, verse 6, where we were told this. They dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And I thought this would be a kind of a fun way for us to look at the power of the Holy Spirit, the way that he directed the church uh, in its earliest of days, and the reaction, of course, that the world around uh, had to it, and for us to kind of explore, like, what, what made it that uh, the Romans uh, and Roman society, the people of, of the day and age of the early church, reacted so strongly to the message, right? And as we've looked at each week, we're kind of pushing back and challenging to say it's not oftentimes what we think, right? It's not about political power, it's not about military might, because the church had none of that. Instead, it was the, the radical message that they began with, and as we've looked at over that the last couple of weeks, we've especially focused on the power of the Holy Spirit. So, uh, who was here last week? Raise your hand if you are here last week. Now, uh, raise your hand again if the Holy Spirit inspired you to shut up at all, at any time last week. Was anyone inspired? <laughs> the whole, I, I was on Facebook a bunch, and I shut up a lot. So, not perfectly, not 100%, but yeah, so, so we've been really focusing on the power of the Holy Spirit, um, and we look at that now today as we think about a new, what I'm calling Peter and John, right? And so if you think about it, right, Peter and John, when we had last seen them prior to the book of Acts, uh, they're, they're, they're just not necessarily uh, being who they're supposed to be. Peter has denied Jesus. Uh, John runs to the tomb but doesn't go in first. And, and John and Peter had to reconcile. I don't know if you ever thought about that because by now, John's been telling this story over and over again about how he's the fastest one. And Peter and John are like arguing about it. And John's like, are you going to deny, are you going to deny that too? No. See? Burn, right? And so, okay. Anyway. Um, so we have a, so, but we have a new Peter and a new John. And I'm suggesting that that comes by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to look at these five stories that take place in Acts chapter 3. Uh, and four, and so as kind of we're doing something different again for this series because I'm encouraging you to get out your Bible or your Bible app. Uh, I'm not putting all the stuff on the screen anymore. We don't need to cover why that is. Um, <clears throat> but um, uh, we're going to pick up at the lame beggar healed in Acts chapter three, verses one through ten. So it starts off right. This is uh, we're told that that Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man that was lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the Beautiful Gate, to ask alms for those entering the temple. Now, if, uh, if you've ever seen a picture of the temple, we think the Beautiful Gate was probably the gate. So some people think it's the gate that led not into the temple itself, but from the courtyard that the Gentiles could be into the temple area where the women could be, or from the place where it, the women could be into where the men could be before the, or the holy place. And my personal opinion is I think it's probably the second one. And we'll see here why in, in a second. But any, in other words, though, the thing that's significant is that this man has been carried into and placed at the gate where his countrymen are going to recognize him, right? These would be Israelites, sons and daughters of Abraham who would, who would see him. And so he's placed there daily so that he can receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And then I love the kind of attention to detail here, and, and maybe it's because Luke is a, a physician, because uh, you'd think to yourself, well, you know, if you're in this guy's situation, and they say stand up and walk, you're going to be like, no, I don't want to do that. Um, but we're told, and Peter took him by the right hand and raised him up. So, so Peter doesn't wait for him to respond, right? He grabs him by the hand, yanks him up, and then look what Luke says. He says, um, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And now look at this. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with him, walking and leaping and praising God. Right? And so if you think about it, this man has been lame from birth. We're going to be told a little bit later on since he was 40, he's about 40 years old. 
So that he didn't have some accident or something, but he was actually born this way. We don't know exactly what it was. And so he's never learned to walk, right? So in my mind, I picture, and I'm, this is, I'm going way back in time here, I'm picturing Bambi on ice, <laughs> right? He's leaping and for joy and happy, but he's never, he hasn't, he's never walked before in his life, right? But, but the way Luke describes it, he's leaping for joy. And we're told, and all the people saw him walking and were praising God and recognizing him as the one who was at the beautiful gate of the temple and asking for alms. And then we're told this, they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And, and these two words that are here, wonder and amazement, are, are, they're kind of interesting ones in Greek because they're not just like, there's a little bit of, uh, if not fear, uh, an uncomfortableness, right? It's not just that it's amazing, but it's amazing and I, I get the willies about it. Does that make sense? Right? They're like, you don't see this, this every day. And so what we see here is the, by the power of the Holy Spirit, G Peter and John performed this miracle. Now what's interesting about it, if you think about it, I just want to dive in this for a second. Did this man ask to be healed? So when Luke told his story in the book of Luke all the time, the way that it normally went was someone would approach Jesus and say, son of David, have mercy, or something like this, right? But instead, here, Peter and John actually act out of mercy. And so it's not, this is not a miracle they perform because of a response of faith. But now we actually have them performing one because the Holy Spirit is going to use this in the early life of the church. So we're told that while he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. He said, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? Isn't that an interesting phrase? Power or piety. And so I think what that kind of expresses is that in Jesus' day and age, right, there were people who could perform miracles. Jesus wasn't the only one. We're told in other rabbinic stuff that, that people could do some miraculous things. And so for the Israelites, the Jewish people, they thought, well, okay, it's done by the power of Yahweh. Or, so now you've got to really think about this. This piety word is interesting. So you remember that Jesus is asked one time when there was a man who was born blind. They, are, he's asked the question, remember the question? Why was this man born blind? Did he sin or his parents? So the, I think they're still operating from this place. This man who was born lame must have been born lame because they're either he sinned or his parents. And so what Peter is alluding to here is there must have been some sort of cultural idea and concept that, that for for sin to be removed from a family, someone had to have extra piety, extra godliness, or something like that. I, that's the only sense I can make of that phrase. It's not by our own power of piety that we've made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers. And this is so important what Peter actually says here, right? So you may remember in the Old Testament after God called Abraham and said, I'm going to bless all the descendants after you, and then he had, there was Abraham, and they said, well, who do you follow? We follow the God of Abraham. Then they had another generation. It was the God of Abraham and Isaac. Then they had another generation, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and now they're like, this is getting out of hand. We can't keep doing this, right, for every generation, right? So then it became the, sometimes the God of Abraham, sometimes the God of our fathers. But what Peter's doing here is he is connecting Jesus, the person that many of them saw walking around and put to death some 50-so days ago, He's connecting them with the God who called Abraham, right? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied. That's called irony when Peter points out someone's denial of Jesus. <clears throat> whom you delivered and denied in the presence of Pilate when he called to release him. But you denied the Holy and Righteous One and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by his name, and his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith of the true Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And I highlight this verse because we've, we've made a radical change. Uh, if you've ever heard me preach through the Gospels and talk about the miracles of Jesus, I, I try to point out to you that for the most part, the majority of time, miracles by Jesus are not to create faith. They're in response to it. 
Not always, but for the most part. And that's why so often when someone asks Jesus for a miracle, he takes them away in private in order to perform it. And, and so the thing we oftentimes misunderstand is we think Jesus used to perform miracles to create faith, but he didn't. But now in the life of the early church, by the power of the Spirit, this is going to be the point of miracles. That, that, that what we're going to see is that the reign of God, the kingdom of God that is ushered in now through the presence of Christ, through his church and his people, is reversing the effects of sin in this world. Right? And Peter is identifying that with the person of Jesus Christ. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers, but what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that Christ would suffer and be fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. And so he, he goes on to, to deliver the speech and, and to remind them, right, uh, all that has taken place, all that has happened, and he ends his speech to them this way. You are the sons of prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. And so Paul, or Peter here, ends his speech, right, by trying to remind them and give them the hope that, that this is what was promised. We, we didn't realize it, we didn't And I um, talked about how that's about average for a first sermon. Is that, you agree? A first sermon, it's usually right around 3,000 3, conversions. Yeah, yeah. so it, it, was, it was pretty average. And now his second one, he's delivered his second one, and uh, hear how it goes. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And they attested to them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. And I'd say that's about right for a second sermon, right? 3,000 the first time, 5,000 the second. Now, the bad news is by the third, it's zero. But um, yeah, so, so, the, so this actually, this miracle, the Holy Spirit uses this miracle in the midst of these, these people because they, they knew about Jesus, right? All the events that took place weren't that long ago. And so in this powerful demonstration of what the Holy Spirit guiding his people, his church, and this world looks like, it leads to this, this miraculous event. Um, sorry, I don't want to do that one yet. Um, on the next day, the rulers and the elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem uh, with Ananias the high priest, Caiaphas and John and Alexander, who were all of the high priestly family. And when they had uh, sent, set them in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? They want to know how. And, when they, and Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people. And, and I think this is kind of, uh, kind of significant. Because Peter has already done a couple amazing things. Peter and, and, and John have performed this miracle. Uh, he's given this speech that 5,000 people have converted. But Luke is going to say here specifically, uh, Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, right? So those other things he did, it was like, it was half a tank, right? <laughs> but here it's filled. But I want to connect this and have you think about this, uh, connect it to our Luke reading. Oh, did I lost my spot, sorry. In Luke chapter 12, did you hear, catch this in the readings? Um, I lost it. Oh, there we go. Um, and when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. See, that's, uh, brothers and sisters, I don't think that's an accident. Right? Luke himself is actually showing the, the fulfillment of the promises of Jesus. That, that, that he assured them that, in the, that coming in the future was a time of trouble. 
a time of persecution. But he, didn't, he told them to not be afraid about it because the power of the Holy Spirit would be with them. And so Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means the man was healed, then let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him that man is standing before you as well. And this is so important because what it means is that Peter and John, the other apostles, they are identifying the person of Jesus Christ as the power that is doing this. That's not themselves. It's not coming from them. It's demonstrating and always continually pointing to Jesus. This Jesus is the stone who was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name among uh, name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now I want you to think about that for a second. They have just said to the people of Israel, the one whom Yahweh called Abraham, and to the leaders of that tribe, that group of people who have worshipped Yahweh exclusively for 100 years, he says to them, there's no other name by which you can be saved except for Yeshua, Jesus, the Christ. This is... This is, is, this is sacrilege, to be quite honest. I mean, it, it, it's powerful stuff. And, and so look how we go from a guy who denies Jesus just a few days before. The difference, of course, is the power of the Holy Spirit. And I, I love this. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and common men, they were astonished and they recognized they had been with Jesus. So we're told they're unlearned, right? Means they didn't have schooling. And that common men, your ESV is being very nice because the Greek word is idion. They are unschooled idiots. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition, right? This man, they've all known. All of Jerusalem who's ever been in the temple has seen this man and know that he's not been able to walk since birth. What are they going to say? But then they commanded them to leave the council and conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do to these men? For a notable sign has been performed through them, as evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. We can't deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let's warn them to speak no more to anyone in his name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have heard and seen. Some people, this may help you summarize it. The Pharisees, stop talking about Jesus. The apostles, you know what? I'm going to talk about Jesus even harder. Uh, this is a deep pull from the office, if you're not. And from what I can tell, there's no office fans in there's one office fan and yeah um yeah so they say no we're going to keep talking about jesus and when they had further threatened them they let them go finding no way to punish them because the people were all were praising god for what had happened for the man on whom the sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old and, and so the response of this, I think, is powerful. And, and this is a text that we hardly ever preach on, this section right here. And yet I think it, it's probably one of the more powerful and important ones. Because we're told when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made heaven and earth and the sea and everything, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan predestined to take place. Think how powerful this is. They're looking back at what has taken place, and even in the midst of recognizing that they were powerless, they know and confess that God was not. This is happening by what God had said, and this, I think, is my favorite part. And now, Lord, look upon these threats 
and grant to your servants peace from all persecution and comfort so that we may have quiet and content lives. Wait, that's not. (laughs) And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. The early church did not pray for an end to persecution. They prayed for boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. That's what we call an instant answer to prayer. And then I want to do this last section real quickly, verse by verse. So, now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Oftentimes we, we struggle, I think, with, with, uh, with being bold. We think uh, a lot of times we feel as if we're alone, maybe in our places of work or learning or, or leisure. Uh, we, we step into those places and, and we think to ourselves, you know, we're the only Christian there, we're, we're, we're timid to speak out. But the message of the, of the early church and the book of Acts is to remind us that, that we have the presence not only of the Holy Spirit, but his people with us. And I think this phrase is particularly interesting. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And that, that, that Greek word for soul is psyche. It means you're who, you, who you are at your core, not just your external person that you present, right? So they believed in their heart and their soul. They were united in one thing. I think how powerful that is. Um, I shared with you last week, and I'll do it again here in a moment, some of the results of our, um, our survey that 5.2 did with us. And um, they've been doing this with you know, tens and twenties and 100, almost 100 churches now. And they said to us, we have never seen a church whose responses to the survey held up the community that they feel with each other as much as yours has. Never. I thought I was going to do it. Um, And I just want to to have you just think about that. How powerful and important that is. To be united of heart and soul. To, To believe that we are not here alone. That we have other people who love and surround and come around us. That they're the ones who, who bring us into uh, a new relationship, an expanded relationship with God, because they bring different hurts and failures, but also different victories and hopes. And it's why we truly believe that, that life is lived out together here in worship, but outside of here in life. And so uh, our life groups are up and going at the moment. Uh, so this is kind of a terrible commercial for them since you can't join now till September. But mark your calendars. If you've never tried a life group before, I really would encourage you to do so because we think it's a powerful, powerful thing. Now, the other interesting thing that came from the survey was they said, uh, and this is where when you see the slide and the thing about community, he said that that word community was used two ways. One, this community, and two, a strong desire to reach. And so the other thing they said was we've never seen a church so united in saying we have to reach our community. We want to make what we experience here with each other in community what they experience as well. And so it looks a lot like what I think is described in the book of Acts. Well, now I gave you guys a chance to donate all your possessions last week. Not a single person called the church office. So we're not quite there yet. But with great power, the apostles were given their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold, laid at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed as each had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called the Apostle Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the Apostles' feet. And just, I want to say something about this real quick. This is foreshadowing. We're going to hear about Barnabas a lot. And we're going to hear he's called a, a son of encouragement, right? And we're going to wonder why. Well, he was an early convent who's, at the, and the, by the power of the Holy Spirit, lived what he taught. He lived out the, the, the faith that, that he was called into. And, and so we're going to meet him uh, later on uh, in the book of Acts. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight so that we remark on it when we, we get there. 
So this is similar to what we talked about last week that I, I would just really encourage you to take this, this home with you. What the Spirit was doing in the early church, He is doing now in this place. It's not something that He did, used, did and used to do. He's doing, he's doing it now. And even though we believe He's calling us to do it in a, in a bigger way, a, a greater way in our community, I hope that you see and experience the truth of it even in this moment. That he has already begun to create in us a heart and soul that are united in one thing, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.